DiscerningHearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Dr. Lillis is an associate professor and the academic dean of St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, as well as the academic advisor for the St. Juan Diego House of Priestly Formation, or the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from his lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He's the author of Hidden Mountain, the Secret Garden, a theological contemplation of prayer, as well as numerous other books focused on the spiritual life. In this series of conversations, we discuss the letters of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Anthony, thank you so much for joining me again. Chris, it's good to be with you. Thank you for having me. We continue examining, I would say praying with, the letters of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Yes. This letter is letter 158. It's to a seminarian, Abbe Chavagnard. He is the brother-in-law of her sister, Margaret Elizabeth of the Trinity's sister, Margaret's brother-in-law is Abbe Chevignard. So, so Margaret, now her last name is Chevignard. The seminarian has begun to correspond with Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is trying to support him through a seminary. By now, she's a professed religious. She has a special mission as a Carmelite to pray for seminarians and priests. And so she's gotten permission to write him as part of her works. It's a beautiful letter. Letter 158 to Abbé Chavenard, February 24th, 1903, Dijon Carmel, Amo Christum. Monsieur l'Abbé, before entering into the great silence of Lent, I want to answer your kind letter. And my soul needs to tell you that it is wholly in communion with yours letting itself be caught, carried away, invaded by him whose charity envelops us and who wishes to consummate us into one with him. I thought of you when I read these words of Père Valet on contemplation. The contemplative is a being who lives in the radiance of the face of Christ, who enters into the mystery of God not in the light that flows from human thought, but in that created by the word of the incarnate word. Don't you have this passion to listen to him? Sometimes it is so strong, this need to be silent, that one would like to know how to do nothing but remain like Magdalene, that beautiful model for the contemplative soul, at the feet of the master, eager to hear everything, to penetrate ever deeper into this mystery of charity that he came to reveal to us. Don't you find that in action, when we are in Martha's role, the soul can still remain wholly adoring, buried like Magdalene in her contemplation, staying by this source like someone who is starving. And this is how I understand the Carmelites' apostolate as well as the priests. They both can radiate God, give Him to souls, if they constantly stay close to this divine source. It seems to me that we should draw so close to the Master, in such communion with His soul, to identify ourselves with all its movements, and then Go out as he did, according to the will of his Father. Then it does not matter what happens to the soul, since it has faith in the one it loves who dwells within it. During this Lent I would like, as St. Paul says, to be buried in God with Christ, to be lost in this Trinity who will one day be our vision, and in this divine light penetrate into the depth of the mystery. 
Would you pray that I may be wholly surrendered and that my beloved bridegroom may carry me away wherever he wishes? Adieu, Monsieur l'Abbé. Let us remain in his love. Is he not that infinity for which our souls so thirst? Sister M. Elizabeth of the Trinity, R.C.I. Our Reverend Mother asked me to express her gratitude for the canticle. How good she is, and how she gives God to others. Don't you agree? On Monday I will offer Holy Communion for you. Don't forget me either. So it's a very, very rich letter. The first thing, we've seen that Elizabeth kind of writes the context of her letters. They're kind of a living expression of the communion of saints. In this instance, and it's true of priests and seminarians that she writes to, she feels a special closeness of soul that somehow what she's con- doing as a contemplative, they in a complementary way are realizing in their priesthood. She has some expressions in here that are very, very powerful. She says, I'm wholly in communion with you so that her soul, like his, is letting itself be caught, carried away, and invaded by him whose charity envelops us. And and so this idea of Jesus invading the presence of the Lord, invading our hearts, enveloping our hearts, carrying our hearts away, these are words of of a, a deep, kind of a prayer. They describe a kind of prayer or a tradition calls mystical prayer. Mystical prayer is that prayer in which it's not primarily so much what we're doing by our activity as much as it is what God is achieving through his divine action in the soul. The Holy Spirit moves the soul in a deep and powerful way. Other saints too have described this deep movement as an invasion has an envelopment. And Elizabeth uh, is already borrowing some of this language. She also uses in this letter the idea of being buried as another image of this contemplation. To be buried means to have died uh, so that your life is completely poured out and you let go of your life. As you are buried, as you let go of your life, as you die with Christ, you open your soul to receive his life. And so she's during this Lent, I would like, as St. Paul says, to be buried in God with Christ, to be lost in this Trinity who will one day be our vision. The death to self, we call this in the Catholic tradition, mortification. A lot of people think that this is somehow like a, a white knuckled uh, act of the will where you, you know, with all your might, let go of something that you really want to do. For Elizabeth, it's not that. For Elizabeth, mortification or dying to yourself, uh, renouncing something that's difficult to renounce. This is an act of love, an act of allowing yourself to be buried in the presence of the Lord. And it's that kind of action that has opened her up to this, what I'm calling mystical prayer, this divine invasion. And she's assuming in this letter that because she's experiencing this this in Carmel, surely Father Abbe uh, Chevignard well, as a seminarian, is going to be, has experienced this in seminary. She'll come to pray for him that he does experience this in seminary. This kind of prayer is extremely important for formation for the priesthood. Anthony, it, as you were speaking, I mean, especially in this portion of the letter where she says, letting itself be caught, carried away, and invaded by him. It, you know, it occurs to me that, especially particularly for the Christian, in our baptism, did we not actually invite that? I mean, we welcomed that. When right at the beginning of, in particular, the liturgy of baptism, we ask, why are you here? What are you seeking? We're seeking baptism. And what does that provide for you, faith? In a very real way, God is invades it, but we've welcomed it. Mm. So we may not have realized we've done it. Yes. Uh, well, and that's one of the reasons why spiritual theologians will say this mystical prayer that I've just described, it's not something extraordinary, but it's an 
ordinary development of baptismal grace in our lives. And, and Elizabeth will come to see this. Right now, she's writing this to a seminarian, and she identifies with what he's doing, with what she's doing in, the Car- in Carmel. As she goes on, she's going to come to the understanding that this kind of prayer is something that all her friends should aspire to and that she wants everyone to have. Her reason for doing this, but she'll write about this in a, a retreat that she writes for her sister, uh, Margaret. It is part of the grace of baptism. Baptism, as you say, opens this whole thing up. And so the faith that we actualize in the sacrament of baptism, the faith that is exercised there, that is entrusted to us by the church through that sacrament, that faith unfolds into this prayer of deep intimacy and communion with the Lord. And my soul needs to tell you that it is holy in communion with yours, letting itself be caught, carried away, invaded by him whose charity envelops us and who wishes to consummate us into one with him. I thought of you when I read these words of Père Valet on contemplation. The contemplative is a being who lives in the radiance of the face of Christ, who enters into the mystery of God, not in the light that flows from human thought, but in that created by the word of the incarnate word. When she speaks again in quoting Pierre Vallée, the contemplative moment of gazing on the face of Christ, that is something that is so prevalent in the lives of the saint. There's an awareness and the importance of actually that moment of the gaze upon the face of Christ. Mm. That Can you break that open more for us, Anthony? Sure. In contemplative prayer or, or the prayer of contemplation that is so thematic in this letter, the word itself, contemplation, means to see or to behold. Of course, we're not seeing with our physical eyes, our bodily eyes, but we're seeing, we're beholding with the eyes of the heart. The heart, the deepest core of who we are, spiritually sees things. We perceive things with our hearts that we can't perceive with our earthly eyes. And, and in particular, our hearts uh, see things through the gift of faith that we have in the church. And the most important thing that the eyes see through our faith is the humanity of Jesus. In the humanity of Jesus, the disclosure of his divinity as the eternal Son of the Father. The face of Jesus is the object of our contemplation as Christians. What we mean is in the face of Jesus, his whole humanity is disclosed to us. As we turn our hearts to his face, as we think about that face, and we think about what that face suffered for our sakes, if we think about the gaze of love that is in that face, uh, we see two things all at once. The first thing we see is the greatness of the Father's love for us. The Father loves us so much that he has spoken his eternal word, the word that has been with him from the beginning. He's spoken his word into our flesh for our salvation. Doing that, the Father has given us and trusted to us everything that is most dear, of greatest value to his heart. He's entrusted to our hearts. Uh, He's entrusted into our care. And so that's the first movement of the contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer sees the love of the Father through the face of Christ. The second movement of contemplative prayer as it gazes on the humanity of Jesus is is that it sees the truth about humanity. The face of Jesus is a face that has suffered our infirmities and uh, our indifference and our rejection and our hatred towards God. Jesus' humanity suffered all of that. And when we gaze into his face, we see that love that has suffered and we see that the suffering the evil that has caused that suffering is not greater than the love that is there, that the love is deeper and more real than the suffering. Contemplative prayer beholds all of this at once. 
The contemplative is a being who lives in the radiance of the face of Christ, who live in that radiance to see the love of the Father and the truth of our humanity, who enters into the mystery of God, this love of the Father, not in the light that flows from human thought, but in the created by the word of the incarnate word. Now here, uh, Elizabeth doesn't describe this, but this will be a grace that unfolds. The word of the incarnate word that Père Ballet is speaking of is the words of sacred scripture. So if somebody say, well, how do I begin contemplative prayer? Père Ballet would say, read the scriptures, memorize the scriptures, because the scriptural word opens up for us the truth that is in the face of Jesus. The scriptural word is the word of the word of God, uh, the word made flesh. Do you, if you want to know Jesus, you need to know the scriptures. So the scriptures, by faith, open up for us this contemplative gaze on the face of Jesus. Off we try to do Lexio Divina. I don't know if we connect it with that particular understanding. Mm. Do, do you think that might have a grain of truth in it? I think a mistake that sometimes can be made in Lexi Divina is that we try to seek the face of Christ with the light that flows from human thought. In other words, if we can just calculate and figure out and, and analyze the scriptures enough, I will finally be able to grasp God somehow. I remember I was in a group Lexio situation. I spent hours and hours going over this passage. It was my turn to help lead the group. I was a student at the time. You know, and the passage I had was about joy is from the writings of St. Paul. And so I did this analysis on joy, thinking that I was going to impress my brothers so much. This is in my prayer group at Steubenville. Everybody was irritated and upset by the things I said, because all of it was merely the product of human wisdom. None of it was really the product of prayer. I, true, I was sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament while I was doing it. The whole time was not a conversation with the Lord, as if I had received a living word that I needed to, to listen to in the silence of my heart. The whole time was my speculating about what St. Paul was trying to say to the original audience at the original time that it was written. And that kind of work, that ex exegetical work is important, but it's only a preparation for prayer. Uh, Lexio Divina requires a kind of sacred silence before the word, a reference to what the word of God is saying to us through the words of scripture. It, it's like listening to, more like listening to the, a loved one where you approach that person with reverence and attentiveness of heart because you treasure what they say. You, you don't have to calculate and figure that out as much as you need to receive it into your heart and let it form your judgments. I, I think those who approach Lexia Divina a little bit more like a moment in a relationship with the living Lord who is personally present, rather than, as I did, a puzzle to be solved or a problem to be worked out so that you can say something that impresses others. I think what happens is when you listen to it has in, in the context of a personal relationship, when you are silent, there's a deeper kind of fruit, a richer fruit that's born in the heart. Mm. She'll go on in this letter to talk about the need for silence, about that desire, that craving for silence. And yet she, then she brings in the interesting paradox of how can I remain silent if I'm in action? And yet that's exactly what can happen. Well, this is a, a beautiful thing. She uses the Magdalene in Martha. Don't you have this passion to listen to him? Sometimes it is so strong this need to be silent, that one would like to know how to do nothing but remain like Magdalene, that beautiful model for the contemplative soul, at the feet of the Master. Eager to hear everything, to penetrate ever deeper into this mystery of charity that he came to reveal to us. Don't you find that in action, when we are in Martha's role, the soul can still remain wholly adoring, 
buried like Magdalene in her contemplation, staying by this source like someone who is starving. So the Magdalene, this time in scripture scholarship and, and piety in the church, Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, they're kind of put all together, you might say, mm -hmm. where Mary Magdalene lies off and where you have Mary of Bethany. In the religious imagination, these things are, the two people are closely associated. In France, this devotion to Mary Magdalene is foundational to the very church. There's a tradition in southern France where there's actually a cave to Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was believed to have spent the last days of her life interceding for the church and the world in this cave, buried deep in this cave. In fact, that's a kind of image that Elizabeth uses for contemplative prayer, to be buried in contemplation, to be buried in the mystery of God, to be completely absorbed in him so that he completely surrounds your being. On one hand, contemplation is about being aware of his presence within you. And on the other hand, it's, it's about allowing yourself to be immersed or submerged or buried in his presence so that all you can think of is his presence. Mary Magdalene, for in French piety, especially the 19th century, early 20th century, is kind of the living image. She embodies that in the French church. And Elizabeth feels very inclined to that. But Elizabeth also knows that we don't just spend all our time in contemplation, that even in the most contemplative life, there's times of action. And in the priestly ministry, there's going to be times of action. And so how do you balance action and contemplation? Well, this Martha was the one who was working in the kitchen while Mary Bethany was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And remember the story, Martha, you know, kind of <laughs> says to Jesus, tells Jesus, will you please ask Mary to help me? And Jesus kind of, you know, admonishes Martha a little bit. And only one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the better part. The most necessary thing is for Elizabeth of the Trinity is to listen and be attentive to the Lord. She would say what the Lord wasn't telling Martha was not to work in the kitchen. He wasn't telling her to stop doing that. He was inviting her to listen to him while she was working and uh, to be attentive while she was doing what was necessary, the one thing necessary to, to be able to show him hospitality, be attentive to him with her heart. Elizabeth is picking that up in this letter, and she's saying, this is what we need to do, so that even when we need to take on the role of Martha and take care of practical things in life, we never stop listening to the word. We treasure and ponder the word. We don't get so caught up in what we're doing that we allow ourselves to do, be deceived into thinking that what we're doing, these practical things, are the most important things. The most important thing, the one thing necessary, is to listen to the word of God. Silence, whether we are deep in prayer or maintaining the spirit of silence while we're working, then, is the key to the Carmelites' apostolate and the priest's uh, ministry, she tells Abby Chevignard that if we're going to radiate God, if we're going to make God known in the world, we must stay close to the source, which means living in this kind of silent attentiveness, doing our ministry and our practical work in the silent attentiveness to the Word. That silent attentiveness to the Word, that in a very real way, it speaks of humility, doesn't it? Because I, maybe I'm grasping at this, Anthony, but I think so often, particularly those who have felt called to a, an even stronger action in the world through a ministry or through some type of response, it could be anything from being a catechist in, in a local parish program or somebody who, ha, who feels they need to do something bigger, social action or whatever that might be, that sometimes we and you've spoken about this before, that somehow we feel good because we're doing something good for God. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to cite that. I mean, that might be one of the graces that you receive is the joy of doing that. But there's something different about responding and doing something in our own power mm -hmm. and having that attitude in which you just do 
the great whatever, because you're so focused on the Father, you're doing whatever. Mm. It's not you doing it. Does that make sense? No, this this is good. And you're right. It's a, Humility is one important word for what she's talking about. Humility comes from the Latin humus, which means earth. And remember, Adam was created out of the dirt. God breathed life into the dirt. And so when we, we remember that we're dirt that God has breathed his life into, this changes the way we do things. We have meaning. We have life. We have the ability to do something beautiful with, with our lives because God has breathed his life into us. If we want to realize the purpose for which we're made, we need to be reliant on him, allow ourselves to be reliant on him and the life that comes from him. Elizabeth of the Trinity uh, to the same idea by talking about the movements of Christ's soul, that as we're attentive to the word of the word, as we're attentive to the face of Christ, the movements of his soul as he went about his earthly ministry and lived for the glory of the Father, as he prayed to the Father and gave glory to him, but also as he healed people and was present to them, even as he is present to Martha and Mary, in all of that, there were these beautiful movements of his soul that where he was completely obedient and humble before the Father. Elizabeth believes that Jesus wants to communicate that whole interior life and his whole interior life to us. He wants to, to entrust it to us. And that contemplative prayer, living in the silence, gives him the space to do that so that his interior movements of heart can be our interior movements of heart, whether we're in action or in prayer. Uh, another powerful word besides humility that gets to this, Chris, is the word obedience. And we'll, mm -hmm. we'll return to this in future letters, but obedience means to, to listen. It's the kind of listening where you make yourself vulnerable to the judgments of another. This listening, obedient heart and prayer means that you're, you're vulnerable to the judgments of God. You let God change your judgments about a state of affairs so that you can share his judgment about it. And again, these think about the movements of Jesus's heart, the judgments that he made, the way he saw the world, the way he responded to the world. Elizabeth is saying all of that can be ours if we are attentive to him, if we enter into this holy silence, if we draw close to him. When we do that, when we are living by these interior movements of Christ, she believes that we're doing everything in accord with the will of the Father. And her assumption is, uh, and this comes from St. John the Cross, Jesus never did anything that was not the Father's will. Everything he did, he did for the honor and glory of the Father. The interior, When we receive his interior movements into our heart, he teaches us to do the same thing. Mm. What else can we glean from this letter, Anthony? Well, we're coming to the end of it. There's a couple really powerful things, though, that are going on. It seems to me that we should draw so close to the Master, in such communion with his soul, to identify ourselves with all its movements, and then go out as he did, according to the will of his Father. Then it does not matter what happens to the soul, since it has faith in the one it loves who dwells within it. During this Lent I would like, as St. Paul says, to be buried in God with Christ, to be lost in this Trinity who will one day be our vision, and in this divine light penetrate into the depth of the mystery. Would you pray that I may be wholly surrendered and that my beloved bridegroom may carry me away wherever he wishes? Adieu, Monsieur l'Abbé. Let us remain in his love. Is he not that infinity for which our souls so thirst? Uh, when we are involved with the will of the Father, she goes on to say, since it has faith in the one who loves and dwells within it, it doesn't matter what happens. This is a theme. She doesn't go beyond 
uh, develop this more. And we'll see this in future letters where she will develop this. But when you live in the Father's will, completely vulnerable to the movements of Jesus's heart, so that you're doing everything for the glory of the Father, just like he did. One of the things that happens is that you're a little bit indifferent to what happens to you in life. This line is important for Abbe Chevignard because about this time, there's some huge scandals that are emerging in the church. And there's a, a lot of crazy stuff going on politically in the world, if that sounds familiar now. Uh, <laughs> I was just uh, thinking that. I thought, mm, well, there's nothing new under the sun. I've not seen his letter to Elizabeth. I don't even know if it still exists. But it is likely that he wrote her concerned about the politics of the diocese and concerned about the national politics, politics that may even uh, involve his exile from France and hers, that the laws were going to be enacted that that churches lands, give religious the opportunity to return to secular life or to be exiled. And all of these things are being talked about. The bishop, who will eventually be removed from his office, the gossip at the time is that Rather than resist this and rather than stick up for people, the bishop seems to be enabling the authorities to do all of this. He seems to be going along with them. And so there's some question about whether or not he's part of a, a Masonic organization. And, and so you can just hear all this sensationalism. And Elizabeth says, if we're moved, if we're silent before the Lord and vulnerable to the judgments of his heart, all the movements of his soul, we're vulnerable to these things and we stay in the will of the Father. No matter what happens, we're going to be fine because those exterior things, that's not really the most important part of life. The most important part of life is our faith in the one who dwells in us. And so this is, that's the context then for this next line, which during this Lent, I would like to be buried in God with Christ, to be lost in this Trinity who will one day be our vision. And in this light penetrates into the very depths of the mystery. Elizabeth believes that the Holy Trinity is such a rich and beautiful mystery of love that it's worth giving her life to, even in the midst of turmoil and sensationalism and gossip. She doesn't want to give her life to those things because those things are lesser realities and she doesn't want those things to define who she is. She wants the Trinity, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit in perfect unity of love and life and knowledge. She wants that life, that uh, reality to be what characterizes her life, her reality. And she's inviting uh, Labbe Chevignard to consider the same thing. The more we're lost in the Trinity, the more we let the Trinity, the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be what we contemplate, to be what we think about to be what we turn our hearts towards. There is a light that penetrates us that allows us to see this mystery deeper and deeper in a more meaningful way. To realize this, Elizabeth kind of entrusts herself to the prayer of this young seminarian. Pray that I may be wholly surrendered and that my beloved bridegroom may carry me away wherever he wishes. Uh, this is that attitude of obedience, or you could speak of humility to be surrendered, to be buried. and But for her right now, uh, she's brought a new dimension to this surrender, this being completely captivated by the Lord, whom she sees as her bridegroom, the object of all the affection of her heart, the object of her devotion. So the Trinity then isn't a an idea, a concept, an intellectual object. The Trinity for her through the bridegroom, Christ, who loves her, is, is the object of her devotion, the object of her deepest affections, and, um, and, and, uh, and, and her contemplation isn't an intellectual exercise, uh, which she's, you know, kind of remotely uh, aware of. Her devotion to the Trinity is one that kind of enraptures her whole existence, even the deepest movements of her heart. Final thoughts, Anthony? I think this letter invites us to consider burying ourselves in contemplation. We'll return to Mary Magdalene in future letters, uh, but for now, I guess leaving you with this, I, 
I went to southern France to the cave where Mary Magdalene is said to have spent her last days. And you climb kind of a, a mountainside to get to it. It's about a 45 minute hike from a retreat center. Uh, the, the uh, place in France is called saint Bomb. When I entered into that cave, I realized at once this was the cave that all the kings of France used to go to on penance. Some of them would go barefooted up the mountain as an act of penance. So it's a very penitential place. At the same time as I entered the cave, I was moved by the number of young people who were there. And they were young people who were profoundly reverent and deep in prayer. It was like they had found a communion with the Magdalene and the way she buried herself in attentiveness to the Lord. And the effect on me was twofold. One, on one hand, uh, the, what occurred to me instantly was, wow, I don't know if Mary Magdalene was really here, but if it wasn't her, it was somebody like her because this is a prayerful place. You can feel the spirit of God here. And the second thing, especially looking at the young people, is you wanted to go deep into prayer yourself. You wanted to just spend some time in silence in the dark of that cave for the altar of God that is there in adoration of the Lord who was present there. And I think as we read this letter, I'd invite our listeners to do the same thing today, to allow Elizabeth to take them into this place of the heart where they can be buried in the presence of the Lord and into the mystery of the Holy Trinity to let this mystery captivate them because it is a mystery of love and life that precedes everything that is to which everything that is is directed. It's the ultimate meaning of everything, a fellowship of friendship, love and life. And it's been entrusted to us by baptism. It is ours by our faith. And all we need to do is be silent before it and allow it to permeate our hearts. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you, Chris. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. Or download the free Discerning Hearts app located at the iTunes and Google Play app stores. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lullis.